I'm here with uh, Joe Petrelli. Well, I'm really glad I'm here. What was it that you wanted to get from the conference, and uh, what is it like the key message that you want to send to people? Derek Evans from uh, AFBI, Agrofood and Biosciences Institute. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Jack. Thank you for the invitation, I think, because uh, it's noted that the excellent speakers who have gone before me this morning of all that conservation angle, and here I am, the bad guy in the room, representing commercial interests. Uh, nevertheless, I hopefully can confine myself to giving you some understanding of um, the uh, eel fishery on Loch A, which reputed to be the largest wild eel fishery in Europe. Um, and maybe just to set the scene geographically, um, we are located in Tunbridge uh, in Northern Ireland, fairly central within the province. Um, and we're situated on the northern shore of the northwest corner of Loch Ney, uh, where the loch empties into the lower river band. I should make the point that there are six significant rivers which flow into the, into the loch, but there's only one uh, river flowing out of it and flows north to the sea by the lower band and is therefore a very significant and important um, migratory corridor for, for fish. So this is just a view of our site at Tombridge, relatively new site, uh, built um, 25 years ago. Uh, in the centre of the picture you will see a structure on the river itself and we'll come say a bit more about that in detail because it is key to our operation uh, on Loch Ney, that's the silver eel weir, one of two silver eel weirs, the bigger of the two, I should add. Um, I should have perhaps uh, opened by saying that um, I have been involved with the fishermen of Loch Ney for some 35 years now. Uh, at times it seems a lot longer, a lot of times you wonder where it went to, but in my current role I, I have held this uh, for about 10 years now following the passing of our founder, uh, Chairman, uh, Reverend Father Oliver Kennedy, who some of you may have heard of before. So there are a few uh, points I want to make. Um, we are the largest uh, freshwater lake in British Isles. Um, it drains, the basin drains about 43% of the landmass of Northern Ireland, which was a significant basin in terms of drainage. Surface area of about 150 square miles, a shoreline of about 80 um, miles. Uh, it's a relatively shallow lake with an average depth of about 9 metres. Uh, just a brief history of the May of the um, company itself. Uh, the company known as Tumi Fishery Limited was formed in 1925, almost 100 years ago now. And uh, they acquired um, the lease, the long term lease on the eel fishing rights on Loch Ney. Um, it's actually a 5,000 year lease, and we're less than 100 years into it. So, as I say, we have some more Guinness to make the app, I think the ad says. Hopefully. Uh, in 1959, um, the company was taken over by a consortium of Dutch and English fish merchants based in Gunningsgate in London. And their primary focus was on the silver eel fishery on Loch Ney. Um, and for that reason, they would have preferred uh, the local fishermen not to fish for the yellow eels, or as we call them locally, brown eels, on the loch itself. There was a limited amount of fishing, but the main focus of attention was on the silver eel fishery. And this resulted in a number of prosecutions, um, some were described as persecution as well, but certainly there were uh, a litany and a catalogue of of court cases over decades of fishermen being prosecuted for illegal fishing. And it, again, the same was happening in the early 1960s. And in, in around that time, there was, there was a, a, a case which went all the way to the, to the High Court again and found in favour of the then owners. But arising from that, or born out of that, was a, a drive from a, a a small number of fishermen who banded together wondering if there was a better way to do this and they came up with the idea led by a local uh, priest 
um, at that time, Father Kennedy, who I referred to earlier, uh, and under his leadership, they formed the Poverty in 1865. Um, and uh, that, along with that, came a 20% shareholding in the company, that gave them a seat on the board and a foot in the door. Um, and a relatively short time later, by 1971, uh, the cooperative had obtained outright control uh, of the fishing rights for Loch Ney, the fishing rights for Loch Ney. So the company structure, uh, it's just over 630 shareholding members, with a board of directors, made of five uh, persons, uh, and a management committee who are elected by shareholding members based around the Loch Shore. So there's a committee of 20 there, and as you can imagine, a committee of 20 is quite a sizable one when it comes to decision making, but we do value the input of, of shareholders and particularly shareholder fishermen. Um, so I think we'll skip that because it's a bit of a history lesson, but we, have, we are steeped in history of, 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 of the transfer of the rights and acquisition of the rights and so on, uh, which goes back quite a way at this time. Um, so we see ourselves uh, with the objective of the aims to provide a socio-economic benefit to the region to secure a viable future for that. Excuse me if I have to turn me back, I just can't read the other one. Uh, to maintain and enhance the approach to conservation, to ensure continued compliance with our uh, aid management plan targets, to continue with restocking programme, to develop and expand scientific research, and to play our part in the recovery of European restocks. And uh, a footnote at the bottom, which is more relevant and more in recent years because we have diversified to include other uh, fish species found in Loch Ney as part of our processing operation. We refer to them collectively as steel fish, and, but I know that's not the main interest today. Um, so, yellow reef fishing, our season runs from May to October, generally speaking. We're, we're due to kick off now in the first few days of May. Um, Technically, we can fish until, um, according to the law, we can fish to January next year. But as far as the yellow age fish is concerned, the weather will dictate that. Days get shorter, water temperatures drop, um, and usually by the end of October, it's pretty much wrapped up for the season. Um, we have uh, a number of key conservation measures which we stick rigidly to, um, and I think those have served as well over many decades. Um, the main conservation measures are the operation of a quota system. Uh, sorry, I should start off with a, a limit on the number of permits, and this has caused a great deal of angst over the years when people are disappointed through not gaining entry to the fishery as readily as they might have expected to be, particularly as ours is a, a, an industry which is um, it's steeped in heritage and tradition. Um, I often comment that if I were to go to the list of share of permit holders today, the family names which I read will be exactly the same as we read 60, 70, 80, 100 years ago. So it does follow in, 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 family, in families. We have operated a quota system right from the outset, when in the days even when quotas were not a, a, a well-known phrase or the, the use of quota in that sense. Um, regulation of fishing method, we have a uh, weekly closed season, um, which we're not required to do, but we have a 48 hour closed season, not required on our statute, that is, uh, and restrict uh, observation of, of, of uh, size, uh, minimum size requirements. Now, fish passage uh, is obviously key to us. This all takes place in the lower van. We have the inward, inward migration of the uh, glass eels, stroke elvers at this time of year, and then later in the autumn, the outward migration um, of the silver eel catch past the, the same site. So the picture on on your uh, left is of an elver trap. Uh, it's just upstream, or at, rather at the tidal extent of the lower band at Corain on the north coast, about 40 miles from our own site. Uh, these are fixed uh, traps one on either side of the river. There are a series of other four, four other sites uh, upstream of that uh, where weirs exist and we have to provide uh, navigation for the elvers. At this particular site, this is our main one. This is an operation has been over the last uh, month or so, uh, has been going reasonably well in the past few days. One of the problems we have is that um, 
the, the lock levels, the level of water in Loch Ney is contro controlled by a series of three uh, sluice gate operations and this trap was located beside one of them, um, the main one in fact, and uh, it, as has happened uh, just overnight, or sorry, yesterday and, and, and today, uh, they've had to open these sluice gates um, to lower the lock a little and that effectively writes off um, our uh, elder migration at this point in time. It's not been a great season thus far, but we remain hopeful. Uh, in connection with some of the other questions earlier, our season typically begins around mid to the end of March. We have an ingrained, ingrained in our heads that come St. Patrick's Day, uh, appropriate enough date, the 17th of March, we, we begin to look for elders. And in fact, we have seen them earlier in that, but in very small numbers. And uh, Derek uh, Evans from AFI is with us today, and uh, he'll probably refer to this, but he has seen them earlier in the season, uh, and, uh, and again this season as well. But in terms of quantity, this is the time of year for us now. But again, we're very subject to, to the, the tides and the sluice gate openings. Uh, we do, alongside of that, uh, since the mid, uh, mid 1980s, when we first saw signs of the decline that everyone else has referred to, uh, we have found it necessary to have a supplementary restocking program, and that has involved purchasing additional stock from areas where there are a surplus, such as uh, in France or the rest of the Channel area. And certainly, Andrew will be familiar with, the, with that exercise and referred to it earlier. Um, our, our main markets um, uh, are in the European mainland. 80% um, of our uh, eel project, product uh, goes through to, particularly to Holland, but also neighbouring countries, um, Germany, Belgium, and so on, and is largely retailed as a smoked eel product. Um, and then the second element of our operation is the silver eel fishing. Uh, as I had indicated earlier, that's located on the, on the lower ban. Um, again, it's a, this is a natural fishery. It's a wild fishery, so everything's driven by the climate, the wild environment, and so on. So uh, the dark of the moon is relevant, in case you're wondering what the caption means. For those of you who perhaps don't know, um, that the peak run of silver eels from the system will occur during that period in the winter months when there's little or no moonlight. So it's basically 10, 12 days uh, in the middle of the lunar month when we're the transition from from uh, the old moon, the last of the old moon, the third phase of the old moon to the first phase of the new moon. And uh, if that uh, coincides with uh, high water conditions and stormy, wet, Nights, those are the good nights for fishing. I think Jack has maybe experienced that with it in this year. Um, but yeah, we're very, very dependent on, on, on conditions um, for, that to, for that to work. Uh, we do uh, market in the region of about, uh, about 200 tons of yellow eels per year, um, 60 to perhaps 80 in a good year, tons of silver eels. That's nothing like what once was. It's probably half what it once was. And of course, um, it's um, the objective is to pr provide a high quality product uh, for the market. Um, the smoke deal retail product uh, in, in the mainland um, is highly sought after, particularly because of its um, texture, its taste, its fat content, in particular its fat content is suitable, uh, very suitable for the smoking process that's used and the result is a, a product of, of, of high quality which remains our unique selling point and we do have a lot of competition on that market these days, particularly from farm deals, um, but we still feel as though we have the aids there. Of the, of the other 20%, probably 19 out of the 20% will be marketed uh, in London and will be retailed as a jelly deal product. And again, they're noted for the quality. The quality is probably less important, for the, uh, dare I say it, for the, smoke, uh, for the jelly deal product, but it's certainly of, of high importance to, to um, our Dutch, uh, Dutch clients in particular. 
Um, in terms of our restocking and conservation and so on, we do feel that uh, sometimes, yeah, when you mention the fact that it's a commercial fishery, you're obviously exploiting uh, the stock that you have there, but we firmly believe that we are showing that can be done in a controlled and sustainable manner. Um, I was no, I was interested to hear earlier about the importance that, that Joe and others put on, on having data sets and so on. And I think um, we, we perhaps maybe can commend ourselves to an extent in that even prior to the cooperative's involvement in this, um, there's huge amounts of data that has been collected from the NABAN system as it's known, some of it dating back perhaps even 100 years at this time. So we, we have uh, pretty significant data sets on, on elder recruitment um, and, and silver eel production as well. I omitted to mention actually when we're talking that um, about the uh, yellow eels, uh, when the cooperative took over, actually the uh, the objective also changed. I, I referred to the fact that the previous owners' primary concern and primary focus would have been on the silver eel fisher. The whole rationale behind the uh, cooperative approach to it, which obviously, as the name suggests, requires a cooperation of fishermen. The objective was to, to involve as many traditional fishermen as possible and to provide an adequate uh, livelihood for them. So that changed the emphasis somewhat, but it also generated a huge problem. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm not taking any credit for this whatsoever, it actually predates me quite a bit, but there had to be uh, a, a line of thought there that, okay, we're, we're now targeting an earlier age stage, we have to do that very, very carefully. Otherwise, uh, we will run into huge uh, conservation type problems. And that was important, even in a very basic commercial sense, because the structure of the company was such that the revenue from the silver reef fishery was actually used to, um, uh, to cover the overheads and expenses of the company, and to some extent subsidize uh, the income of fishermen as well. So it was equally important to the company to on one hand, provide access to the law to the people who would have claimed a moral right to, 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 act to that access, and on the other hand, to make it pay. And even fast forward to where we're at, we have been in the last few years. Um, again, some people may perhaps find it difficult to equate the idea of, of a commercial fishery uh, being run with conservation type objectives. The point I would make without going into any great detail on that is that in our particular situation, um, we could not have one without the other. In fact, we levied the fishermen to help with the restocking program. We fished for uh, a percentage of the silver eels, which again helps to, with the restocking program and, uh, and other expenses. Um, so it's, it's, it's all part of a a continuous circle for us and I think our escapement uh, targets have been met pretty much each year. Um, we've sailed a bit close to the wind on one or two occasions but overall I think we're one of the few wild eel fishers in Europe who continue to make those targets. Um, so uh, in terms of practice of fishing with two main methods of long lining which is shown here uh, this uh, second uh, is draft netting, sorry, just, yeah, draft netting, so those are two, two main methods. Uh, fight night fishing is not allowed, trawling is not allowed, these are all regarded as being detrimental to stocks and the, the habitat. Uh, just a few shots to, to give you an idea of what the typical Loch fishing boat looks like. He, he is a rare breed, I don't know where you get happy fishermen these days. Um, this is the structure on the, on the lower van, um, where we do the bulk of the silver eel fishing in the autumn time, and generally that happens between September and uh, late November, early December. I'm sure, yeah. So, obviously, nighttime operation, I explained earlier that 
Uh, the, the ducks have to line up in a row in terms of conditions to make a good night's fishing, but yeah, I mean, historically, you know, 30 tons of, of silverage could have been caught in a single night fishing on this weir. Now, more recent years, the biggest night has been about 10 tons. Uh, but we had a 10 ton catch this, this past season, so maybe we're, we're doing, as others have suggested this morning, rocking it on the bottom in terms of, of, of catches and production. Uh, it's just a shot of the, the grading of the catch within the factory. In this particular case, it's silver eels. Uh, so the males on your left and the females on the right. Uh, we do ship mostly live, uh, mostly by air, but occasionally uh, if we hit a large run of silver eels, thank you, uh, if we hit a large uh, run of silver eels, we can call on a tanker to take out a, a, a load to ease the, ease the pressure, should there be one. Uh, Jack, yes, your rope making, which I know enthralled you when you first saw it. Uh, and um, yeah, it's a very simple process, maybe just to explain, this is where the straw comes from. But the point is that it's an oak straw. This has nothing to do with these, by the way. Um, it's an oak straw, and the problem with modern day machinery is it chops the straw uh, too, too finely, too short for rope making. As well as that, uh, cereals are now grown or are modified to be short straw in the first instance. So we have to turn to our friends, the, the vintage uh, machinery enthusiasts, who would maybe perhaps grow half an acre of corn each year, purely and simply to have uh, something to demonstrate with the machinery at the various shows during the summer months. So when the, when the season's over, we can um, buy, purchase some, some of this straw from, uh, from these guys, and we, we do make the ropes and still use them, as Jack says, uh, on three out of our five rear sites at the moment. Uh, we also use whistle map and other methods as well, but yeah, we stick to the traditional ones. Uh, on this uh, screen, I was I just wanted to mention in passing, uh, Lochney is one of only three products in Northern Ireland which acquired product, protected geographical indication stamps back in 2011, presented by the then Agriculture Minister Michelle O'Neill. Um, so the other two um, are Armagh Bramley apples and Cumber potatoes. Um, and as far as I'm aware, we're still, still, there's still only three of us uh, with that. Um, just very briefly, just to give you an insight as to um, the other species of Lochne that I referred to, the scale fish, so you have perch, pike, green, roach, trout and pollen. Uh, probably the most lucrative for the fishermen are the trout and the pollen. We find the pollen is a particularly interesting one um, because it's unique to Lochne. As I understand it, it's the only European vertebrate to be found exclusively on the island of Ireland. And it's only found in five lakes in Ireland. And there's only one commercial stock of it, and that's in Loch Ness. And we're very keen to uh, protect that as well. Use our permit scheme, use all the other uh, tools that we've used, hopefully successfully, over the years uh, with the uh, to regenerate the scale fishery on Loch Ness. Um, um, uh, in terms of market, uh, main markets for trout and palm and perch would be uh, France, Switzerland, um, Germany. Uh, the coarse fish uh, tend to head east of, to the east of Europe. So, yeah. Um, so that's our Loch Ness pollen, as we described as a freshwater herring. Uh, it's very similar in appearance uh, and a, a, an earthy taste. Roach, uh, quite a lot of roach from Loch Ness. Uh, Derek from Alfie often refers to these, I think, as potentially the curse of Loch Ness because of the, their, their volumes. Uh, I've used for them. I think the perch are catching up this year, but uh, we'll, find, we'll discover all of that in due course. Um, so, yeah, so the perch look like that. And again, please. Um, this is the type of net, they're set nets, referred to as travel nets. Um, 
difficulty with these is that they do not discriminate other than the nice size. Uh, so there are particular issues there with bycatch we'll have to be careful of. The steel fish are always uh, marketed as a frozen product, so it's always good to see trucks going out as well. And we do uh, some work with local um, tourism initiatives. Uh, there's big interest in, in the story of the eel um, and the story of the property itself. We're part of the Sinasini cluster group in, local to the area. And hopefully we're playing our part to educate people uh, in the importance of the eel to our part of the world and to um, basically uh, show them what we're doing uh, to help sustain them. And I think I'll have to leave it to that. Thank you very much. Hi Jack, it's um, Steve Coates here. It's actually a question for you from the earlier session. Um, so when we started the Thames Estuary stuff 30 years ago, we um, used to use a simple biological kick sample net in the margins, just to, just to see when the elvers were running. So that's just a very simple tool that people could use when elvers are running, just to get an impression of, um, you know, timings and season. And actually leading on to Joe's presentation as well, Joe, I was fishery officer for the um, rowdy catchment in the 90s. So if you want any of the 1990s date, I'm including Redbridge, Redbridge Golf Course, I've, I've got that as well. Fantastic. It's very nice to meet you, Steve. I don't think we've ever met. We have a long time ago. I've changed. I've got fatter and greyer. It's and, uh, me. <laughs> my hair's fallen out. Anyway. That's for us all. Any questions from the crowd then? Anyone's online? Ah, sorry. Uh, hello there. Um, Sandra Stewart from uh, Fourth Rivers Trust. Um, I, I work with farmers, Pat, and I noticed in quite a lot of your um, pictures of the fishermen, they're a bit like the farming community. The average age seems to be, dare I say, a 50, 60 year old. And there wasn't a lot of younger people on your. And, and I don't know if that's the same in, in your industry. You said there was less quotas than the amount of people that wanted to quote us. But what's going to happen? Are there less people in industry? Are they getting older? What do you see as the future of it? Very good question. Thank you very much. I'm very perceptive of you to notice that I didn't have a photograph actually of one of our younger fishermen, but yeah, it's a very serious issue. Um, we're finding the same with the local agricultural industry, obviously, as, as we are throughout the UK. It's 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 certainly uh, a problem, um, and to be honest, from the outset, I do not have the answer to it. Um, I suppose we we have perhaps um, rested on our laurels to an extent in that regard because this decline uh, that has come about as a result of the the, the decline in, in, in recruitment and, and, and demand for aids and so on has co coincided with actually the decline in the number of boats being manned to fish. Um, so it's not, we have not had to go out of our way to reduce the number of boats fishing. That sort of has happened by natural causes, if you pardon the expression, people retire, people die off, people become ill and so on. But the, the, the fundamental problem remains very much the same that we're not attracting enough younger people into the industry. Um, ultimately, uh, you know, to sustain the fishing fleet at the sort of numbers it is, which uh, should have said perhaps that we, we issue in the region of 95 to 100 uh, eel fishing permits per year. Once upon a time, that was 150 plus, um, dating back 15, 20 years. So it has reduced considerably. Ultimately, how do we attract uh, younger people, um, it's not easy. I mean, it, but it will come down to being able to to provide them with a reasonable uh, level of income. And I suppose our interest in the scale fishing is going some way to that because this, the eel season is very, uh, the eel uh, business is very seasonal. 
uh, our introduction of the other species and the processing and marketing of those on behalf of fishermen has, has, has lengthened the season right into the winter months. But the fact remains that um, it's, it's a difficult uh, vocation. It's, you know, it's, you know, I often think or say to people, you know, if, if I were 20 years of age and, you know, the opportunity of a third level education and a, a good job versus being on Loch Ney at 4 a.m. On, uh, on the morning in all weathers, uh, working 12 hour days to prepare your gear for the next day and so on. It's, it's really a no brainer. Um, but I, I honestly do not have the answer. Uh, I think one thing we have in our favour is that we have this heritage and tradition which has been passed down through families, generations, successive generations of families. And those are the ones that we find that are bringing the younger people in as helpers. Whether we can make it worth their while to stay with the industry or not remains to be seen, but a very difficult question to answer. It's, so maybe do you think that, you know, it's a bit like in farming, we're looking at post 2024 here and we've got to look at the environment. Do you think that maybe more, dare I say, conservation jobs could fit in with your, your fishing jobs as well? I mean, would that be, you know, then you might not have to bring in eels from elsewhere when you, you were bringing them in, you said you brought them in from France. Would, you know, is that the way? I don't, because Scottish farming is going to have to change dramatically in terms of the environment. And I don't know if you're seeing that in your industry as well. And there's maybe an opportunity to integrate better. There, there, there possibly is. Um, our conservation effort, um, I, don't, I, 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 don't, I don't honestly believe at this point in time that, the, that we can do without the supplementary stocking. Um, I'm not sure that there's a lot more we can do to enhance our own recruitment. Uh, I think that's pretty well covered. Um, and, you know, I would not disagree that there's possibly more that we could engage younger fisher people in, uh, particularly from a conservation side. I would, wouldn't disagree with that at all. I mean, ultimately, our fishermen are um, the stewards of our future, uh, without a question of doubt. And, and, you know, there is a lot of work that can be done on Loch Ney, and we are looking into collaborating with other NGOs, other government bodies and so on, who are trying to collect the, the different, different obje uh, objectives and, 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 and schemes, and we, we fully intend to become part of that, and, and also the tourism trade, by the way, as well, uh, because there's, there's a growing interest on, um, in that side of things as well, and there will be scope to involve some younger people there for sure. Thank you very much. Thanks. Uh, Derek Evans from AFPI. Question for Jack and Joe. Uh, build a field of dreams and they will come. So, Elver Passage, absolutely top notch stuff and uh, simple as best. A complete advocate for that. Um, for both of your systems now, given that passage is being enhanced, is there any consideration being given for these regions in terms of stocking? Rewilding, as some people want to call it, now that these barriers or the actual water corridors are opened or reopening, why not enhance them with additional elvers, similar to Loch Ness? Yeah. Take a minute. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, okay. So, yeah, it's a it's a it's a hotly debated topic. I mean, um, I think the strategy in agreement with the local environment agency team, so the Thames Eel Management Plan team, is to try and see what we can do just by opening as much habitat as possible. That is the strategy. So the assumption is is that we have enough recruitment into the system and if we allow them to uh, access all areas, we will uh, culture a, a, a higher biomass of silver eel for escapement. That's the idea. And we have had, there has been stocking, generally through um, at the eel in the classroom process. That, so that's that's gone on and we see it in our, in our, in our 
trapping data, you know, eels that have been released. So we have tried, uh, well, the, the, the permitting team uh, in the agency and us have tried to see whether we can hold back on stocking at the moment, um, uh, just to see what, what we can achieve through opening up habitat. That's been our approach. But we're very aware that another approach is to start stocking and see what the impact of that is. I'll uh, jump in from yeah, the Scottish side then. So we, with uh, SEG actually, we had a number of eels ready and rearing to go really. Um, hundreds of thousands of them that we're going to stock in areas that have had um, historic barriers on them for a long time. And the outward migration of silver eels has meant that um, been able to get down some of these barriers, but not been able to get back up. So historically, there were eels in these areas, and now there are not. And we were blocked uh, through um, a, a series of different um, government channels because of the parasite Anguilla carassus. And um, this was really based on the fact that we don't have a great understanding of carassus in Scotland. We have an understanding that it is here, but they weren't too sure on the distribution. And that comes back to the fact that we don't understand enough about this species. We have sampled, I myself have sampled, eels from a number of locations that have Carassus parasite in them, and this is news to essentially the, the government agencies involved in this. So if we're not able to understand the eel uh, in its entirety, even just looking at Scotland, we can't do these additional management techniques which we could do, use, like restocking, and it becomes barriers to us when we have these tools that we could potentially use, like restocking, we literally had eels waiting to come in, and we had to stop that and pause that, and uh, that I, I believe was a, a real shame, and it just comes down to the lack of knowledge that we have, so further in this knowledge basis within Scotland and broader means that we can look into all different avenues, including stocking for potential future conservation efforts. Can I just come back as well, because, um, you know, with or without stocking, the, a, cons a key conservation aim has to be to recreate, uh, to sort of reconnect natural migratory pathways. So that's the basis to allow, you know, rewilding is about putting natural processes in the driver's seat and moving eels from one area of high abundance to a different area is not a natural process. So by the way, the basic re rewilding premise has to be to reconnect wetlands as much as possible. I'll ask the Brexit question. Um, has Brexit had... No, sorry. What impact has Brexit had on your ability to access steel to restocking into Lockmere and also on your map that's been able to ship eels across to, to um, Holland, Germany, Belgium, etc.? Okay, um, yeah, the Brexit question. Uh, yeah, there's, certainly the Brexit uh, had the potential uh, to be a cliff edge for us, given that 80% of our trade was with was, was, was main, uh, mainland Europe. Um, a no deal scenario would have been catastrophic for us. The fact that there was a deal uh, at least kept the door open. So then, uh, the first indicator was that yes, we because of the uh, because Northern Ireland remained part of the customs union, effectively that door into Europe remained open, um, so that was a relief. But alongside that, then um, trade with GB uh, became very very difficult, um, not possible in the beginning. Um, but after a period of, of representation and negotiation that was uh, agreed that uh, on our daily permits we could resume that trade in the eel rate product into London and uh, that while it involves a lot more administrative work and additional costs and all of that sort of thing we're glad to have that situation I suppose the one concern at this point in time is that because it's that arrangement is, is heavily reliant on what's known as an ordinary protocol uh, and it's remaining in place, and we're just a couple of weeks away, if, if that, from elections uh, again to, to our assembly. And uh, this, the protocol and the future of it has become uh, a big issue. So, again, we're, we, 
we're a little nervous about the eventual outcome um, of that. The one big issue that remains, which was stimulated by Brexit, is the, the, the import of, of glass seals from the Bristol Town area, from Gloucester. Um, traditionally, we, 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 we have been doing this for 30, 30 odd years. I think we have we have imported somewhere in the region of about 120 million fish over that period. We have naturally recruited just slightly less than that. It's roughly 50-50. Um, but those would have traditionally been flowing across from us a short journey. Uh, but currently, because we do not have any of our airports designated as a port of entry, uh, it's no longer possible to fly them from Gloucester into Northern Ireland. They have to come by road and ferry, which can be a prolonged uh, exercise um, and sometimes involves an overnight stay for the drivers and so on. So it's, it seems a bit of a nonsense and is making this uh, a situation more difficult, more arduous. Uh, but we are hoping that maybe one of our local airports will step up and ask to be um, designated as a port of entry, which would allow us to, to resume that trade with GB again. One of the big issues going back to the uh, resumption of trade with Europe in the late one was that coincidentally our uh, traditional route, if I could coin a phrase, uh, to the European market was to fly from Belfast International to East Midlands and from onward to Belgium and then by road to Amsterdam. Uh, but because of, this, of the restrictions that the endangered species uh, are subject to, um, the issue of our consignment touching down in GB, which was a non-EU country, before flying back into the customs union, was difficult to get around. So at that period of time, and I'll finish with saying this, you know, for two, three years, Brexit was a huge issue for us, and the implications of it caused a great deal of stress and a great deal of worry. A number of the issues have since been been sorted out and ultimately to us, and maybe we're just simple folk, I'm not sure, but uh, ultimately the pragmatic, the simple pragmatic solution is the right solution. It, it makes sense and, and I think that approach has to be applied to the import of glass seals because we're, we're, we're providing, we're paying for the privilege of being able to purchase these, we're in turn providing the ideal habitat probably in Western Europe for the uh, European aim to grow and survive and be conserved in a sustainable way. Thank you. I think we'll have to call the questions and end there. I know there's another question over there, but um, if you catch us in this next break, that'd be, that'd be brilliant. And uh, if you want to join me in thanking all of the uh, speakers for this section of the day. And, uh...